It's a twelve hundred dollar suit. What do you mean it doesn't fit anymore? You know, you know. <laughs> so it's like it's so confusing at first, right? When you like starting off in life trying to figure these things out, right? And, and, it, and it's just like you put all this time and energy into like getting the best stuff, right? Or whatever the experience is, or like I mean, on this great vacation. Anyway, I won't go into the like the long gory details of all my adventures, you know. <laughs> But I climbed the highest mountain, you know? I mean, anyway, there you go, okay. <laughs> and then, you know, it ends, it breaks, it wears out, or you lose it, you know, sooner or later, you know? It's ripped away from you at death, or something happens to it before then, right? And, uh, you know, that's the nature of life, and life is basically wasted. Um, everything that we think is important when we say, I want, isn't in the big picture. You know, Buddhism is a big picture uh, per religion or pursuit or philosophy. You know, it's it's about infinite lives. You know, it's about much more than one lifetime. It's about much more than this life, right? It's about what's going to happen to me over a bazillion years, right? And how does today fit into that? How does this life fit into that? And what should I be doing in that larger context, right? So it's very hard if one is just sort of... Um, instant gratification oriented to to really engage you know in appropriate spiritual behavior right? because if I'm just looking for gratification right now or this week or tonight or you know next month or next year it doesn't really fit with the bigger picture necessarily right it might but typically not right <clears throat> so Anyway, so that's the other worldview, which is problematic, which is just this sort of instant gratification or or, or suffering. I got I'm just trying to get through life attitude, right? <clears throat> very hard to very hard to overcome those things, right? So how to get people to wake up and think about why things are happening and whether they can change them or not, right? Do you have to die or not? Can you actually cause yourself to have a better life outside of getting more money and buying more stuff, right? I mean the way. Typically, we approach having a better life is, and again, this is a cultural thing, if you get more money, you can buy more stuff, and then you'll have a better life, right? <laughs> I mean, that is our culture. And that is Western culture, right? I mean, it, it really is. I mean, it's kind of silly when you put it in those terms, right? <laughs> I, I was just talking to a guy who's like just purchased a $3.4 million vacation home and found out his neighbor got a $3.6 million. He was happy or upset? I'm really upset. He's upset. upset. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, right? I mean, crazy how we live our lives or how people live their lives, right? So, anyway, you know, I mean, some Buddhist schools or, or, or teachers will say, you know, learn to be calm, learn to be peaceful, you know, learn to deal with, you know, the problems of life. But that's not what the Buddha came here to teach, right? The Buddha came here to teach how to end suffering, right? How to end suffering and death, right? <clears throat> so, and it's through a very radical transformation of our own personal behavior. That's the main thing, right? So, that's Buddhist worldview, right? We created our world, we created our reality, and we're living it, you know? Whatever reality we create, we will live, you know? We are responsible for our reality. No one else is. There's no one else responsible. And so that's our main purpose in life. That's the main goal of life. That is the objective in life from a Buddhist perspective is to create the paradisical future reality that we want. I mean, that is it. That is what life is about. That is the primary singular goal and purpose of life to create our future paradise. And everything else pales in comparison to that. And everything else is inconsequential in comparison to that. And we shouldn't be putting much lifetime or life energy into other pursuits other than that. Because if we are big picture people and we're going to exist forever, wouldn't you rather be doing it in paradise than in a shithole, you know? Or whatever you want to call it, whatever kind of circumstance we might find oneself in. So, <clears throat> so how do we change our reality? We change ourselves, right? I mean, perception is reality. Mm -hmm. Buddhism is all about the nature of perception, right? Perception and reality. 
you know? Valid perception. What is our valid perception? Right? Whatever we're taking in with our senses and conceiving of with our minds is our reality. Right? That's the long and the short of it, right? So all the other things which other schools of Buddhism teach, you know, be calm, be patient, they're not the point. I mean, they're nice, but they're not really the point. You know, overcoming death and suffering, mental and physical suffering, is the point, right? So how do you get people to sort of wake up and pay attention in a realm of the crazy? Like, this is a broken realm. This is a realm for the crazy people. The beings who are here are here because they are highly afflicted, because they have massive mental afflictions. To be in this realm, you have to have massive mental afflictions. Right? Your mind has to be substantially disrupted to be in this realm. Or to sit said differently, perceiving this realm is the result of a substantially disrupted mind. If our minds were not substantially disrupted and afflicted and crazed and tormented by all of, by anger and jealousy and all the rest, we wouldn't be perceiving this realm. We'd be perceiving something else. And so it's fairly simple logic to say that it follows if we had an unafflicted mind, right, a different kind of mind, we'd be perceiving something else as our reality. Right? And it's very straightforward. You know, it's not easy. I didn't say it was easy, right? It's very straightforward to understand that if my mind is extremely peaceful and extremely calm and extremely still and extremely uh, sweet and loving and compassionate and good, full of this sort of this beautific uh, content, that I'd be experiencing life very differently, right? And not just from a mood perspective. The very way in which my mind conceives of things would be different, right? I remember reading a story one time. I mean, it's not an exact parallel, but it's, it's um, you know, I, I don't know if you had the experience where uh, when people get old, they, they, their, their brain, the organism of the brain, starts to lose its ability to regulate behavior. So, right, as, as a person gets older and older, and the brain and the various organs start to break down, sort of their, their baseline personality, their impulsive personality, becomes more dominant, right? And so, because, you know, there's inner and outer, right? You know, when, you walk in, when you're in polite social discourse, you know, you, you're able to regulate. Should I say that or shouldn't I say that, mm -hmm. right? That's an inner thought. I won't say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so as, as, as you know, people get older, often that capacity is lost, right? The capacity to self-regulate, the capacity to self-moderate. And so the sort of the, the, the more baseline aspect of their of their mind and, the, and who they are asserts itself, right? And so at, at the end of life, as you get towards the end of life, you meet people who are incredibly nasty because there's just, they're just, there's no check valve on that, you know, on that fight. You know, it's just kind of what it is. And then you meet people who are incredibly beautiful. It's like, there's a beautiful story of someone who's, someone went to the door and they knocked on the door and they opened the door and they said, hi. I have no idea who you are. I mean, it's slight dementia. <laughs> I have no idea who you are, but it's lovely to see you, and it's, we're having a dinner party. Would you like to come in and join us? It's so beautiful that you're here, right? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it's like, it's like that, you know? It's like the mind will process and think and perceive according to its nature, right? And so we are, our job and our goal as practitioners is to create a mind which functions. It, our job as Buddhist practitioners is to create a mind which will only function in a beautiful way and experience everything as beautiful and wonderful and holy and, you know, and divine, right? And that's, that's our job. That's what we're here for. That's the goal of Buddhist practice, right? How do you do that? Habituation. I mean, everything's a habit. And it's not just that. It's not just it's not just habituation. I was reading um, a science article, and it, they were saying um, it was it's very in, it's very in, in vogue now to do studies of brain and neurology and you know and 
how it affects who we are, right? And so they do these studies nowadays about the neural synapses in the brain and uh, when you think a thought that the, the synapses fire, like if you think a loving thought, those particular synapses fire, right? And in the act of firing, the synapses actually grow closer together. So the more the synapses fire, the more they close the gap, right? And then the thought which actually gets processed the fastest is the one which is the pr sort of primary conscious dominant thought to be acted upon, right? So they're actually saying, well, you know, this is a case where thinking a thought actually shapes the physiology of the body, which actually shapes, not shapes, which actually changes the way in which perception works. Because, you know, by closing the synapses that, are, that fire when you think a loving thought, then loving thoughts travel faster and you get more loving thoughts. <laughs> and then it's self-reinforcing, right? And, and it's like that way, you know, I mean, that's, you know, in a sort of a brain neurobiology level. You know, but just at a, at a practical level, we know that we are creatures of habit, right? We know that we live our lives based upon impulses, you know? I do what I did before. And I will do again what I did before, over and over and over again until I somehow change it, right? I mean, like we get out of bed the same way, we brush our teeth the same way, you know, <laughs> they're all habits, right? And we behave the same way, and we think the same way, and we, you know, on and on and on. So our job as spiritual practitioners is to change that. You know, it's this radical behavior modification, it's this radical modification of who we are yeah. and how we think and how we act, right? And it doesn't happen based upon wishful thinking, you know? It doesn't happen based upon pixie dust and somebody, you know, ringing a bell extra loud and, you know, bonking you on the head with a vase or something. You know, it's not going to change your, your base habituation and your base behavior, right? It's not how it works, right? So. <coughs> Mm. So, okay, so Master Shanti David starts to go into the idea that um, we treat ourselves and others differently, right? Uh, at a certain point. We're late, Christopher. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. It's the last freaking class. You're going to come on time, man. <laughs> I brought a friend. I brought a friend. John, John's trying to get old. His old brain <laughs> But because we're Buddhists, we all love you and we're glad you're here. Right. Yes. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Thank you for teaching all this time. And you're on the right side. Where's your friend? Um, they have to get your email address. <laughs> They're here for the cookies. <laughs> They're eating all the cookies, so right. you won't have any. No. Positive loving thought. <laughs> okay. No. Anyway. All right. So where were we? we're talking about. Um, Master Shanti Deva. We're, we're on to Master Shanti Deva, right? And so, um, Master Shanti Deva addresses the objection that we can never learn to treat ourselves and others exactly the same, right? I mean, in the, when we're, we were going through that course, people were saying, come on, there's no way I can, I'm going to treat any other people as well as I treat myself, and why should I, right? I mean, other people are not as important as me. It's all about me, right? And in fact, there's no evidence that I should, right? I mean, Master Shanti, if you recall, Master Shanti David makes the point that it's artificial. The definition of self, the definition of who I am, is is an artifice that we create conceptually, right? Like I stick a pin in in G's finger, it doesn't hurt me, right? So Master Shanti David makes the point. You know what? We have all of these ideas about how things exist and and what they are and what they aren't which are valid at a conventional level of reality. It is true that conventionally we define everything in a certain way. We name things, we give them labels, we give them terms, we structure them, we define them, we say this is this, this is that, this has this value, this has that value, this is over here, that's, you know, I'm here, you're there, right? There's a subject, there's an object, all of that's fine, no problem with any of that. However, all of that is a construct, all of that is essentially arbitrarily defined, right? You'd say, 
There's no way that I would think it's as important to feed another person as it is to feed myself, right? Until you have a baby, if you're a woman. And then all of a sudden, there's someone else who's equally important, or even more important, to feed than yourself. It's more important to feed that person than it is to feed me. So all of a sudden, we went from, I'm the most important person in the world, I'm the most important person to feed to, no, there's, that person is more important to me. They, it's an extension of me, essentially. And this, this arbitrary designation of me not being connected to someone else, or not being, the other person not being important to me, or relevant to me, or a part of me, has a new definition, has a new distinction, right? So there's nothing automatic about it. Um, we simply make these decisions. We assign these values, and we assign these identities, right? So all of a sudden, you know, you have a kid, and you're twice as big as you were before. And you know now that now there are two people that it's important to feed. You have five kids. All of a sudden, it's important to feed five people. Okay. Well, why are those five people important to feed and not those other ones over there? You know. And why five? And why not six? Why not six? You know. Why not four? And you say, well, they're mine. You know, they were my two selves. <laughs> because they were my two selves, they're more important than everybody else. You know. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make any sense, right? It's just it's an arbitrary designation. It's 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 a designation that we assign. Right? And so Master Shantideva makes the point, that's messed up. <laughs> you know, We're making all these arbitrary designations that these people matter and these people don't, and these are more important and these are less important. Everyone deserves to be treated the same as me. Everyone has the exact same status as me, really. You know? and, and assigning these other designations, they're more important, they're less important, it's important that I get fed, it's not important that they get fed, that's just all stuff. That's all our stuff. It's all the stuff that we make up. It's all the stuff that we just, those are the stories we tell ourselves in our head to just somehow, I don't know, because of the crazy lives we live, right? Master Shantideva makes the point that you'll never become enlightened that way. The very fact that we have these arbitrary designations that make me more important than everyone else, or those people over there are more important than those people over there. Or I'm going to help them, but I don't, I'm not going to help them. I'm going to feed them, but I'm not going to feed them. All these crazy arbitrary designations that we assign are the very thing that prevent us from developing bodhicitta and becoming enlightened. It's not possible to become enlightened. It's not possible to, to attain a paradisical state if we have that kind of crazy thinking, according to Master Shanti Dev. Impossible. Impossibility. That's even just at a conventional, logical level. If one is doing any kind of deep meditation or meaningful retreat practice, you get to a point where in meditation you realize that these are, you can see that these are crazy, arbitrary, conceptual designations. It's just like, wow, I really see that there's no difference between that and that other than the mental overlays that I'm providing. You know, I mean, I just called that thing over there that, and I called this thing over here this, and I just... That was just me, you know, all me, all about me, you know. What if I stop doing that? Then what, right? So life would be very different, and we'd live very differently, and we'd behave very differently, and we would treat people very differently, right? So this is Master Shanti at this point. You know, we decide whether people should be treated equally, right? And it's just a decision, right? And that our resistance to doing that is why we're in this suffering realm and why we'll you know, continue to suffer and die in this realm. Unless we can expand the idea of self out to include everyone. Unless we can assign the, the, unless we can conceive of everyone as just important as me. Unless we can say, you know what? How do I exist? How does John exist, right? I'm, a, I'm not gonna digress too much. <laughs> But, you know, I exist as a concept, right? We've been through this many times, right? You can say, the name John was given to me when I was born. I wasn't John before somebody stuck that name on me, right? Didn't have a name. It was the little pink squishy thing. But, you know, so I have a body and I have a mind, right? That's the basis of the designation of beat John, right? Okay? And so, you know, you can do the analysis. You say, is John his body and is, or is John his mind? No, if you take away the body and there's just a mind, you can say, well, John's dead, there's no more John. Or if there's no mind, then 
nothing there either. So you could say, well, if John's his body and John exists in his body, you know, if he, if he loses an arm, is he still, you know, you know the whole thing. I'm not going to go through it. If you take away some of the parts, is John still there? Yeah, you know. Is John in any one of his parts? No, I'm not. John doesn't exist in the little finger, and John doesn't exist in the hand. He doesn't exist in the head, and he doesn't exist in the heart. And you know, you could take away any part, and you wouldn't find John in that part, right? And you could put all the parts together, like when I was born, and it still wasn't John, until so somebody said, that's John, right? So John's an idea. John's a concept, you know? And everything about me is an idea that I have. All the ways I think of myself, all the ways I experience myself, all the memories I have, all the stories I tell, you know, all of my future, you know, meanderings about the, what's going to happen next week and next year, and these are all just ideas, you know, thrown thrown on here. So I exist, you know, as a basis with a concept. You know, there's something there with the, with the concept of a John the guy stuck to it, right? So that's how everything exists. And Master Shanti Deva is saying. Along with the label John the Guy, there's another label that says more important than everybody else. <laughs> right? <laughs> Take that label off. No problem to say John the Guy. That's okay. That functions. That works, right? Lose the label that says John the Guy, who's more, more important than everybody else. Right? <laughs> Have the label John the Guy, who's the same as everybody else. Right? Because <laughs> you're saying Chris the Guy, G the Girl, and you know, they're all just these. Imputations, all these mental constructs that were thrown around all over the place, and we're slapping onto everything. We go look over there, and there's shapes and colors, and it's a curtain all of a sudden, you know? Oh, I called it a curtain, so now it's a curtain for me, you know? And you get into the whole thing. Well, no, it really is a curtain. And we could go, we could do that for a while, but we've done it for seven years, so I won't do it. <laughs> At least not yet. <laughs> okay, so. Um, Yeah, this ma that's Master Shanti David. Causes all your problems. Anytime we're unhappy, right? It's because we're concentrating ourselves, concentrating on ourselves at the expense of other people, right? Like if you're think if we're thinking about uh, other people and their well-being, it's not possible to be happy. Like every single every single time that we're unhappy, every case of irritation we have is based upon selfishness. It's not possible to feel irritated or unhappy. Unless I feel like I'm being shafted by somebody else, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was at work today, you know, I was supposed to be running like 10 different projects. And all of a sudden the CFO is like, well, you don't need to know about those seven. You know, I'll just cut you out of the loop. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> excuse me? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I started, it's getting irritated and annoyed and, you know, Sort of getting getting worked up, and I'm just like, well, you know, what am I going to do here, right? <laughs> so it's like that, you know. If I'm thinking about the CFO treating me badly, right, and like trying to cut me out and you know marginalize me and blah 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 blah, blah and it's like I'm unhappy, I'm upset, you know, I'm getting annoyed, right? If I'm like if I'm thinking about the CFO, it's like, well, what's he want? Well, we'll work for him. I want to make him happy. I feel very differently, right? right? I mean, this is how life is with everything, right? It's just the nature of things. It's, 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 and it's like that all day long. You know, I don't know why. It's just like, I can't believe she like didn't make me dinner again. Jesus, <laughs> you know, I'm unhappy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, you can't find anything that doesn't fit the script, right? <laughs> I mean, there's nothing, right? So. Master Shanti Deva has a point here, right? If you're really thinking about someone else and what they want, you cannot be unhappy. You cannot feel angry or upset if you're really thinking about other people. Impossible. So not a bad practice to go through life with. Very difficult to think about. I mean, imagine if you like went. I mean, just take today. Like if you just went through today, and like and thinking all day long, how can I make them happy? What would make them happy? What would make them happy? It's hard to like even. Not have your head explode when you think about it, right? I mean, it's hard to try to wrap the mind around that. Like, could I have even like done it for ten minutes? Mm -hmm. You know, could I have had, could I have had ten minutes of thinking? Well, let me just try to make everybody around me happy, like without thinking about me, <laughs> right? 
Very, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing practice, right? Okay. So, Lord Maitreya described a six-step process describing where all the trouble of the world comes from. Where does Buddhism say all the problems of the world come from? But how is it that how is it that we collect negative karma? How is it? What is the what is the process? What is the mechanism by which we collect negative karma? What is the the thing that happens that leads us to suffer, right? And Lord Maitreya described how it is that it unfolds that we misbehave, <laughs> right? Six steps, six step process that he describes. And so the first one comes from past lives. We talked about habits, right? We're creatures of habits. We have a tendency from past lives, bok chops, right? Bok chops, seeds. We have seeds, we have imprints, we have predispositions from past lives, right? And so when we were born, our mind stream already has those predispositions, is already imprinted with those predispositions, already contains those predispositions, right? Those seeds, those bok chops, bok chops, right? And they are seeds for ignorance, for wrong view. So we have we have had wrong view for infinite past lives. We have perceived, excuse me, we have perceived things as existing from their own side for infinite time, and we're born with countless seeds to see things as self-existent in this life. Right? So that's the first step. Is is it's kind of almost like original sin, you know? You come in bad. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm just sorry, but you just came in as a bad seed, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so that's the first first thing, all right? And then um, you have the tendencies. You thought of things as self-existent. You enter this life with that in your in your in your karmic pocket, right? And so. What's the wrong way of looking at things? To think that they exist from their own side as good or bad, as having an identity and nature of their own, right? Forgetting that this is a neutral object which I label as being good or bad, pleasurable or unpleasurable or neutral, or whatever the case might be. We forget that everything is a blank screen that we are projecting onto. Right? And so that's wrong view. To forget that everything is neutral, to forget that everything is a blank screen, that we are projecting identity and value and experience onto, is wrong view. Right? Okay? That's the wrong way of looking at things. All right? So that's second, uh, those tendencies, those seeds from past life, ripen. Right? It's those, t those seeds flower, they assert themselves, they ripen, and we misunderstand things in this life. I look over there and I say, that's G, and she's pretty nice. <laughs> All right, I'm not, no, sorry, leave off the she's pretty nice. I say, that's G, she's over there. That's a G over there, <laughs> right? There is a G over there, right? And she does exist, <laughs> right? So that's, that's the second thing, is, is I just look at something and I misapprehend it. It's very existence. I think it exists from its own side, right? So that's second. So, and then I identify it as good or bad. That's G, I like G, right? That's the next thing. And it's coming from G. G is a good person, G is a nice person. G possesses that, right? He's fashionable. Among any, many other good qualities. <laughs> okay, so having focused upon something as existing from its own side, over there, out there, right? And then having liked it or disliked it, right? Because of the qualities it possesses, right? Then what? Then, based on wanting something, I'll engage in negative behavior. You know, I want G's fashionable scarf, so I'll take it. When she's not looking, you know? Then it's negative behavior collecting negative karma, right? So, is it bad to like G? No. Is it bad to dislike G? No, nah, not necessarily. <laughs> she can be misbehaving, you know. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. <laughs> okay. 
no problem in Buddhism to like things and not like things. You know, the Buddha likes to see everyone free of suffering. You know, the Buddha dislikes seeing beings, you know, burning in hell because of their past negativities. Right? No problem. It's the ignorance associated with it that's the problem in Buddhism. Right? Ignorantly liking things, ignorantly disliking things, meaning thinking that if I can push you away when I dislike her. I'll be better off. And thinking that if I can do whatever it takes to get G when I like her, I'll be better off. And the problem is, is that I engage in negative thinking and speech and deeds to either pull G closer or push G away. Because <laughs> I want her or I don't want her. I like her or I don't want her, right? So thinking that G is there and she has a quality of her own from her side and misbehaving to get it or avoid it then causes me to collect negative karma, which then results in suffering, right? So, is it? Sorry to interrupt. Is no, it that point that you check your intention? I'm not sure what you mean. Well, you're you're talking about we come to the fork in the road where we either have craving or aversion. Right. At that point, do you just say, well, what's the intention here? Well, you could flip over to Master Shanti Deva and say, what would be good for this person? Oh, right, okay. I mean, you could do that. I mean, there's a lot of things you could do. Yeah, I so, I mean, you could say, you know, here's... So, I mean, Buddhism is all, Buddhism is all about mind training, lines of reasoning, um, applying the laws of karma and emptiness to every situation. So, the baseline motivation, it's important that the baseline motivation is, I want everyone to be happy, them and me, right? And so how can I engage with them in a way where they will authentically be happy and I will be authentically be happy? And so, um, and I understand that, you know, there's a, a blank screen there that I see as fashionable or a fashion victim, you know, based upon me and the nature of my conceptualizations and projections and the rest. And there's somebody that I see is like really amazing or really not based upon my mind, my conceptualizations, and my projections. So, like, for me as an educated Buddhist, if I see someone, I'm like, oh my god, they're so amazing. Wow, that's incredible. I'm so glad I created that. <laughs> I can't wait to create more of that. Let me experience this wonderful thing that I created. And let me keep creating more as I'm experiencing this wonderful thing. And, you know, so it's, 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 it's very tricky, you know, because it's very easy to flip into many different wrong views. You know, oh, I'm bad for wanting a good thing. That's not Buddhism. You know, I shouldn't have a good thing. That's not Buddhism. That's you know? Catholicism. Well, yeah, well, depending on how you were raised, it's going to pop up, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Where does judgment come into play, too? Like, the, the judging of yeah, the quality like, of good or bad. So even, like, the idea of I want to free all beings of suffering or I want people yeah. to have or be happy, whatever that is, right? Or... So like, you know, I think about, I just, <laughs> I think about parents, right? They're like, yeah. you'll be happy if you do this. And you're like, no, I don't, you know, no. but, <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? The quality of what we find, you know, like, where does that come into play yeah. with, with the, like, you know, how, how, where does that come into play? Is that just, well, well so there's, so there's, there's, um, discrimination, you know, I mean, everyone discriminates. This is blue, this is red, this is good, this is bad. I like this, I don't like that, right? Same as discernment? Yeah, you could say. Okay. I mean, it's just, this is this, this is that. Right. Right. Um, and so, you know, everybody's mind is different, and everyone's mind comes to different conclusions. And so for someone to think, you know, this would help a person. Mm -hmm. Great, no problem. Person B may not agree with them, mm -hmm. or the recipient of that thought may not agree with them. Mm -hmm. No problem. So, you know, if one is sort of in Buddhist integrity, and if I'm a parent or a friend or whatever, and I say, well, this would be really great for you, and you'd really enjoy this, and the other person says, no, I wouldn't, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You know, you'd be like, oh, okay, well, I was just trying to help. Thanks very much. What can I do to help you? You know, as opposed to, no, I'm right, you're wrong. You really would enjoy this, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? That's where, like, the diamond, like, when Geshe <laughs> speaks about the diamond deal, uh -huh. the idea of intention, that's where it comes into play, where it's really not about the end result so much, oh, but as opposed to the intention of the, you know. Yeah, it's, it's almost never about the end result, right? I mean, Buddhistically, you could say karma is 80% motivation, right? Yeah. So you could be trying to help someone and you can hurt them, right? 
You can be trying to hurt someone and you can help them. I mean, there's just no telling what the outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm. What is your inner landscape? I mean, for me, it always comes back to what is one's inner landscape? You know, forget about the outer circumstances. I mean, the thing that's extremely important to come away from the last seven years with is it's not about the externals. It's about the internals. It's about what one is thinking and feeling and projecting. Right? What, what is inside me? All the time, what is inside me? Am I feeling loving? Am I feeling compassionate? Am I feeling thoughtful? Am I feeling considerate? Am I thinking about another person at all? <laughs> you know? Or am I just like, screw the world, you know, I want what I want and I don't care. <laughs> you know? <laughs> me, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever is inside of us is what we're going to manifest and project to everyone around us. So the externals are really almost irrelevant. And if you accept that the externals are a blank screen, they are irrelevant. <laughs> right? All that matters is your inner landscape. All the time. That's a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll take that as a positive thing. <laughs> It never matters what's happening on the outside, other than it is the basis for your inner process. And even that isn't quite accurate, you see. But you still have to get results. Which results? Yeah. Is, so, so I ask you, whatever happens externally triggers something to come, let's say something happens externally and I feel angry, and so a feeling of anger comes up, or jealousy, pick an affliction, right? And then I'm aware of it, and I pay attention, and I think whatever I think, and I deal with it, and I process it, and I, you know, I turn it into loving kindness and, and compassion, right? Did you get a result? Yeah. Yeah, I feel better. You got an internal result. Yeah. Is that more important than whatever the external result might be? Mm -hmm. Depends on what scale you're using to measure. <laughs> if you're using a spiritual measuring tool, it's the most important result. <laughs> right? If you're using a conventional reality external measuring stick, the only thing that matters is how much money you got. <laughs> you gotta pay the rent. <laughs> right? <laughs> or power or whatever measuring stick you want to use, you know. <laughs> But this is confusing in some ways because G doesn't exist except in your own mind anyway. Well, and so as a projection of your own mind, your desire to be generous, charitable, helpful to G generates good karma in your own mind. But karma itself is non-existent. Karma itself is, so, so, is so, empty. So I ask you. And so at some point you say, like, am I really doing this for the benefit of G, or am I doing it for the benefit of my future good karma? Yeah. And are you really looking for your own nirvana? Are you looking for great enlightenment so that everyone is enlightened, so there's no more suffering because no one's going to ever behave in an ordinary way so, by creating negative karma ever again? So, so, so I ask you, mm -hmm. two possibilities. There are all these sentient beings out there, right, that you're conceiving of G and Li and you know, all the rest, right? <clears throat> or there are all these sentient, be sentient beings that you're conceiving in here, right? G and Li and all the rest. Right? Does it matter whether you're behaving in a loving way to the ones you conceive in here, as opposed to behaving in a loving way to the ones you conceive out there? If you believe yeah. the entire world doesn't exist, it's well, nihilism. No, no, no. Right? no so no, that doesn't. I, did, I didn't say that. But if, if there is a difference that. between an, a, an existent G, even though it's not the self-existent Gs you see, do you accept that G exists? Do you accept that there's something, someone called G here? Well, I don't want to get back into mind only school. No, no, I'm just an ordinary, school. unexamined, you know. Is there, are you here? Am I here? I'm not sure. Well. I'd say you're here. <laughs> we I all think you're, you're here. You're here, but I'm external to you, so it's your experience. And yeah. she's but, here. She's but, here. She's but, really but, functioning. But the entire... I see you differently than, than yeah. Christopher sees you, yeah. but you're functioning. You're here. You're real. You, you are real. <laughs> I might put a different label on the entire on world you. is appearances, how do you know? It could be all just... If someone steps on your foot, you're here. <laughs> if someone steps on G's foot, 
She's there. Is she? <laughs> yeah, you'll hear about it. Yeah. Well, but this is the point. You see, it's yeah. the classic. If you think that your projections aren't real, go step in front of a taxi cab and see what happens. But, right. but it could be all a dream. You could just wake up. No, 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 no. That's however, not right. however, it is your reality in any case. Right, right. All right? So your perception is your reality. Okay? If your perception, and it's only a perception, is that a taxi cab breaks your legs and you're in a hospital for a week, it's only a perception, and you're in a hospital for a week, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, it's your reality. Yeah. That's it, and that's it. So that's all. I mean, that's just that's how we exist. Yeah. So, if I, wherever I'm perceiving G, if I'm loving and compassionate, wherever and however I'm perceiving G and everyone else, if I'm loving and compassionate towards them. I am creating a particular mental state. I am partic creating a particular causation that will produce a future result. Think of it, here's another way you can think of it. I am working to configure my mind, my mind stream. Right? Every thought that I have is configuring and reconfiguring my mind stream and how it functions in the future. The thoughts I'm thinking today, all right? are developing and forming and causing the evolution of my mind stream, right? For better or for worse, right? So even if you said, I'm only a mental being, because, you know, in Buddhism there are formless realms where beings are only mental beings. Mm -hmm. It's the exact same story. It doesn't matter if you've got a body or not. I mean, if you're a, form for, if you're a formless realm being with no body, it's the exact same story. The thoughts you think are forming your mind and your mind stream you know, for its spiritual evolution or not. So, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in a realm that has three senses as opposed to six senses, you know, or if you're in a realm where, uh, you know, you think a thought and it manifests, you know, same story. You know, you are, we, the, any being in any realm is working, or not, to create their mind in the present moment and to evolve it into the future, right? Their mind stream, their most subtle mind, right? Something like that, right? Regardless of how coarse or, or subtle their existence is, you know, on a physical or mental basis, right? Same principle. Mm -hmm. Same, same, same for everybody. Out of applause. We have to have fun, it's the last class. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so you know, I mean, like the Pope, you know, the, like the Pope got it right. He came, he came out the other day. It was today, yesterday. I don't remember. He's like, if you want to stop all this hatred and all this terrorism and all this <laughs> violence, love people. You stop it with love. You know, that's exactly right. That's exactly how you stop it. You know, I mean, he, he gets it, right? Don't use hatred. Don't use a gun. You know, <clears throat> I mean, the normal human reaction causes the perpetuation of suffering. You know. And you have to do the opposite of the normal human action, right? Stop being angry, right? You want to get rid of nasty people? Love them. Be compassionate. Being kind, right? Don't use poison or hatred, you know? And then they'll leave your life. You love them, they, they have to change, and they have to, you know, be a nice person or leave. So all the irritating people will leave your life. So um, actively love them. That's what Buddhism says. As they're screwing you over, love them. <laughs> I know, Chris is like... But that's I've actually seen them, they do actually leave. <laughs> cool. It works. <laughs> you know, it's very hard. I mean, Jesus just said, you know, turn the other cheek, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, he wasn't stupid, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like, this is how things work, right? If you don't want violence, if or, you don't want anger, then don't behave that way. Or, or, or uh, Langry Tankway said, if someone harms me for no reason, then I see it as my spiritual guide. Yeah, yeah, same idea, same yeah. idea. Does that mean you don't stop a mugger on the street? I have to love everyone. I can only be loving all the time. I have to be compassionate towards everyone. And so I just like put out the love vibes no matter what happens, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no. Right? No. no. I mean, if you see someone mugging someone on the street, you have to stop them, right? And put a stop of violence, right? But not with hatred, not with animosity, right? I mean, you maybe need to punch them, up, punch them in the face, but you know. Not with, not with uh, some kind of, uh, you know, aggression that's meant to... Or with to a desire to give them good karma. 
stop well, them just, from harming their own karma. Yeah, to stop them from collecting negative karma, right? So anyway, that's the difference between uh, ignorant liking and ignorant disliking, right? Okay. So, I mean, in Buddhism, you're you're allowed and perhaps even required uh, to break your your first seven practice vows, right? Nevertheless, three, the ones of mind, right? I mean, if you need to, to help someone, if you need to break the first seven of your of your practice vows, you know, okay. But you can never dislike someone, you know, to help them, right? You can never have, uh, you can never be unhappy that someone succeeds to help them, right? If you think about the last three vows, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they're mental. So you can never make break, break a mental vow to love, to be kind to someone, to help them, right? So it's like that. So you can You're never- You're not saying you can never do it. You're saying you can never do it to help them. Well, I mean, you can break the vows often, but you know, it's never justified. It's never justified to have a wrong view, for example, a wrong worldview. To help someone, it never it, do, it doesn't compute. You would never it doesn't function, right? It doesn't function that you would say, uh, "I'm happy that they failed, and I'm helping them." It's just illogical, yeah. right? So it's like that. So there's a lot of latitude about the first seven, depending on your motivation, right? But you but you can't break the mental ones. Yeah. I think let's take a break, and then we'll uh, hopefully there's some cookies left. <laughs> then we'll continue. We'll come back.